Dear students, until now we have studied about microbial energetics. So we know how one individual cell will make sure it gets the electron acceptors it requires, the electron donors it requires, the energy it needs to survive in the environment and thrive, replicate and uh, interact with the environment. Now we are going to move on to microbial ecosystems like we did in the last lecture where we, I introduced you to the basic concepts in ecology. So today we are going to go little bit more in uh, advance and look into terrestrial ecosystems which is the ecology of microbes in terrestrial ecosystems. So let us start here. So microbes to live in an ecosystem they require two things, they should have all the resources that they need and they should have the right conditions to thrive. So some of the resources that microbes will require to thrive are carbon. Some autotrophic microbes can utilize carbon dioxide as source of carbon, others require organic carbon material. So this is very important for life as we know that carbon must be available in the right form in the environment. The other thing we know is nitrogen is very essential part of a cell. So if you remember the DNA, the double helical structure that carries the information on how cell would live, what proteins it would make, how it would survive and its activities. So nitrogen is very essential component of the genetic material. So nitrogen should be available in its environment either in organic form or inorganic form. Now some microbes can actually fix inorganic form of nitrogen such as nitrogen gas and they are referred to as nitrogen fixing bacteria, others cannot. So they would require other assimilable forms of nitrogen such as nitrate, nitrite, ammonia or organic form of nitrogen. Some cells also require other macronutrients, remember the word here is macronutrients not micro. So these are nutrients that it requires in good quantities such as sulfur, for uh, phosphorus, potassium and magnesium. Then there are micronutrients that I have not put in this table that are also required and trace amounts. So we have talked about trace elements before how they are essential for making certain enzymes and amino acids so we need them too but in very little amount. Usually microbial communities have a way of finding these micronutrients, trapping them and recycling them over and over. So the environment does not have to be rich in micronutrients but definitely rich in carbon, nitrogen and other macronutrients. Also the environment should have a good supply of electron acceptors and electron donors because all life processes are a redox reaction. They are a, a reduction in oxidation of uh, electron acceptors and electron donors so it is important to have both in the environment. Now when we talk of conditions, the conditions should be just right for the microbe. Now the temperature that is right for one microbe may not be correct for the other microbe. For example, if we have a thermophilic microbe that loves hot temperatures and we put it in cold water it will die. It has to have just the right temperature that it requires ranging from very cold like sacrophilic microbes for example found in ice sheets of Antarctica and Arctic and Himalayas or we can have thermophilic microbes that love to be in hot water lakes or um, undersea volcanic vents. Then the pH should be also right and in one of the first lectures I talked about different range of temperature and pH in which microbes survive. So a microbe that grows in acidic lake will not survive in a neutral or may not survive in a neutral and alkaline lake. So the pH has to be correct too. Now thinking of temperature and pH it is very important to note that human not only micro but even higher orders of life such as human beings also require just the right temperature and pH. For example, life cannot survive in extremely cold environments such as minus 120 degrees Celsius or hot environments such as 70 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Celsius as we know it, we can't survive. And same is true with pH, if pH is very low in our environment, in our air, we will get burned and we will die of necrosis and other diseases. Similarly, if pH is very high, we will have corrosive burns. Next is ORP which stands for oxidation reduction potential. So basically uh, a methanogen which requires a very re reduced environment to survive will not survive in oxidized environment such as air. So not only does methane, methanogen, a methane producing bacteria, it not require oxygen but if it is exposed to oxygen it will die. So in this case we require just the right amount of ORP oxidation reduction potential of environment, the light should be correct too. If there are phototrophic bacteria and they are not getting oxygen they will die and the osmotic conditions. 
If you remember, we have talked in one of the early lectures that cellular membrane is a bilipid in bacteria and uh, it has hydrophilic and hydrophobic end. So, inside the cell there, are, there is some osmotic pressure relative to outside of the cell and if there is change in external conditions, the osmotic pressure in external condition, the cell might either explode or implode. For example, if I take microbes that live in hypersaline environment like ocean and then put it in a freshwater bowl or freshwater lake, then they are likely to, uh, they are likely to uh, lose their integrity. Same is true otherwise if we take water from, uh, if we take microbe from a freshwater lake and put it into a saline environment, it will also lose its integrity and not survive most probably. Then another thing we need to understand, so this is microbe in an individual level. We know what microbes require on individual level, what resources, what conditions. Now let us look at what microbes require when they, we are talking about many microbes present together in an environment because there is hardly any environment where there is just one microbe sitting and you are looking at just one microbe's need. Usually it is either a population guild or community. So now is a good time to introduce you to the concept of population guild and community. I have sort of mentioned this before but let me be very clear. Population is when many microbes belonging to same species are together. So we might have population of E. coli, they all belong to same species. On the other hand, community is when different populations survive together, right? So we might have E. coli, we might have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we might have some other microbe, acidobac some kind of acidobacterium coming there. So we have multiple populations, so we have lot of microbes from different species together, they are interacting with each other, yeah? This is community, microbial community. And now the third word is guild. Now guild is a group of microbes that are same in their function. And this I have talked a lot about when I was talking about metabolism of microbes in previous lectures that because the ORP or oxidation reduction potential of an environment is bound to influence all the microbes that are present in the community, they are likely to have similar functional traits. And we will go about this uh, and I will show you uh, right away what we mean when we talk about guilds. So students, now let us take a look at population guilds and communities within one particular environment. Here we have a diagram of lake, a very rough schematic and what is in blue and wavy is water and this is the sediment and this is the control volume boundary that I have drawn for the lake and this is a cross section by the way of the lake. So let us look at the microbial community present in the lake. So where, look here, the red arrow is showing you the depth until which light can penetrate and its width gives you an idea of the intensity of light that enters and reaches at this particular depth. So until where the light can reach, we can have two kinds of microbes where in the first microbial community we have oxygenic phototrophs. So remember, because this is towards the surface of the lake, we will have re aeration and aeration going on and thus oxygen will also be present in the top surface. So microbes that can utilize the light produce food by consuming carbon dioxide as the source of carbon, they will be present here. The other kind of microbes that we will have here will be facultative or obligate aerobes that require oxygen as I mentioned oxygen will be present here. So the first kind of microbial community, now remember I am calling this microbial community so it implies that there is not just one oxygenic phototroph but there are multiple species of oxygenic phototroph that might be present or in certain unique environments you might only have one singular population of um, oxygenic phototroph or facultative aerobe or obligate aerobe. Now, in community 1, the ones that is a phototroph, they use light, they use carbon dioxide and water and produce glucose and oxygen. Now, facultative aerobe are in cooperation with them. They are very happy to live next to the uh, oxygenic photo, uh, phototroph because they are producing oxygen and they are producing glucose. Facultative aerobes and aerobes in general can consume the glucose by using oxygen as electron acceptor and get tremendous amount of energy from here. So this is and produce carbon dioxide which can be consumed by oxygenic phototroph. So this is an example of cooperation between two different microbial communities. 
Now, in towards the sediment or towards the bottom of the lake, we have anoxic zones, and we might even have completely anaerobic zone. So, anoxic zone zone has like trace amount of oxygen present. Anaerobic zone, no oxygen present. So, in sediment, for example, we might have a third kind of community that is lives in anoxic or anaerobic environment. Now, in this particular community, we might have at the top layer, let's say there is some amount of nitrate present. Now, so the microbes that can utilize the nitrate, why did I say top layer? Because let's say initially when the lake was built, let's say it's a man-made lake, there was nitrate present here. So, microbes started utilizing the nitrate and as the nitrate depleted, they moved on uh, to different uh, electron acceptors and they made a gradient of electron acceptors over time. Why would there be a gradient? Because remember the oxygen is coming in from here and oxygen as it comes in, if nitrate has been denitrified, it will oxidize it again. So, there is higher chances of nitrate to be present on the top of this sediment layer than on the bottom. So, one guild or one functional community of microbes could be denitrifying bacteria. So, bacteria or microbes that denitrify, they are one functional group and they are likely to be found in the top layer. Next, we have the second guild which is ferric reducing bacteria. So, when let us say nitrate got depleted and now we have ferric ions present. So, microbes that can utilize that, reduce them and get energy will be present here. The third guilt and most probably below it would be sulphate reducing bacteria followed by sulphur uh, reducing bacteria and then fermentative microbes and then methanogenic and acidogenic microbes. So, you notice here that as the electron uh, acceptor gradient uh, so, as we notice here that the microbial community gradient follows the electron acceptor gradient. So, here we have oxygen, then we have nitrate, we have ferric, sulphate, sulphur, then we have fermentative condition and then methanogenic and acetogenic conditions. So, a guilt is our microbes that have same function. So, all microbes that are iron reducing microbes, they form one guilt. All microbes that are iron oxidizing microbes, they are other guilt. Now, they might have different populations within them. Yeah. So, within guild 2, there might be many different kinds of iron reducing bacteria. Within sulphate reducing bacteria, there might be very different kinds of sulphate reducing bacteria. So, a guild might have singular population or it might have a community, but the unifying factor for a guild is that their functional characteristics are same. Now, as I mentioned before, population you should remember is one species only. Over all this together, so a community would be here you know the environment is similar, right? their functions are sort of similar, multiple populations living and interacting with each other. So, this is one community, community 2, community 3. Within each community, there are multiple populations. Together, they make a meta community, clear? Alrighty. Now, note here, from top to bottom, we have a gradient of oxidation, poten uh, oxidation reduction potential. We have a gradient of um, electron acceptors therefore, and we also have a gradient of the kind of microbial communities we will have. No, now, because oxygen is energetically most advantageous, we also have a gradient of energy yield. So, the microbes growing on the top of the lake would have would get the highest energy yield and the ones on the bottom that are methanogenic or ferment, uh, uh, acetogenic will have mi minimum energy yield. Alrighty. So, to revise we have single cell physiology, so we have single cells and then we have local communities and population. Remember population is microbe of same species, communities are different populations existing together. For example, in this microbial flock, we have microbes stained red and microbes stained blue all together, this is a community. Then we have meta communities and meta population. So, a meta community and a meta population, the example would be the lake that we just saw and then we have ecosystem. So, we have um, the entire region that includes aquatic components, terrestrial components and air components. So, the range in size also varies. Our single cell can be anywhere from 1 to 10 micrometer. The communities and population can be anywhere up to 1000 micrometer. The meta communities, meta population and we will see some of them today in the lecture can be up to meter and ecosystem more than meters, many meters. So, now let us look at environment and micro environment of microbes, their populations and their communities. So, when we talk of environment and micro environment, let us try to get in perspective of bacteria or a microbe on distance. So, for a human being, 
a 10 centimeter is not a long distance yeah so 10 centimeter we can just approach it very easily but now think from the perspective of a microbe that's only few micrometer in length for that microbe 3 millimeter can be as long as it is as 2 kilometers is for human being so within 2 kilometer radii we can have different uh, as we know we have different populations of higher order of life we can have monkeys dogs cats and rats and human beings again human beings all following different practices yeah different food habits similarly in for microbes within three millimeter space it's a very small space from humans perspective but it's plenty from bacterial perspective that we can have bac microbes bacteria of very different functions of very different populations so if within 3 mm space we can have very very diverse community as diverse community and even more diverse community than we have when we talk about higher order of life like birds and animals and humans and etc insects and etc etc within 2 km radius the other thing is within 3 mm radius you might say well it's just 3 mm the environment won't change a lot so the microbes within 3 mm should not be very diverse but the beauty here is that in the micro scale we notice that the environment changes the gradient of uh, rate of change of environment is very high now on the right panel here i have a picture and this is um, a cartoon a schematic showing you the oxygen levels in a soil micro pore so you know so soil has pores where through which the air and water tra are transported now this is a micro pore so even among pores it's really small and we notice that this is some uh, 12 millimeter in uh, diameter and now what you're seeing in different colors is oxygen gradient so in the brown you have the highest amount of oxygen and it reduces as it goes to orange and then lighter yellow and then blue then a little bit light purple and then dark purple there's no oxygen left so within this six uh, into six milli so we have 12 millimeter range we can go from aerobic microbes to fermentative methanogenic and acetogenic bacteria bacteria so think about it this way and uh, it's so if you look at even this is too big a uh, micro pore by the way even in pores as small as three mi milli three millimeter we have seen similar characteristics similar behavior so in the dark purple region we might have methanogens acetogens we might have sulfur reduction sulfate reduction nitrate reduction nitrate reduction and then obviously oxygen reduction now now all this diversity in the the ORP oxidation reduction potential of this micro environment will result into diverse functional diversity of microbes which will allow a community very diverse community to grow in this 12 millimeter by 12 millimeter micro pore now all these microbes of different kinds they will compete for resources for example in the aerobic region denoted here by dark brown we not only have one singular kind of aerobic bacteria or archaea or eukaryote but we have different kinds of microbes and all of them are competing for oxygen so the one that can grasp oxygen fastest the one that can degrade its electron donor fastest and grow fastest is likely to outcompete other microbes but then there are other factors also that influence um, microbial growth microbial competition so now about microbial comp competition because of this we notice that over time the microbial communities undergo succession so initially we might have um, 10 different aerobic microbes here and after some time we notice we have eight because two have been wiped out and let's say microbe commun uh, population number four was the most abundant initially but now that might have been outcompeted by microbial population number six so we notice that microbial communities undergo succession over time because of competition and on the other uh, end of the in the in the other end of spectrum we have cooperation so microbes cooperate with each other for example someone's waste product could be someone's input and in the next few slides we will see how microbes not only cooperate with each other but they also cooperate with higher order of life such as plants and such as humans and if you remember this is one of the first things i talked about in introductory uh, lectures that we have more non-human cells in our body than we have human cells begging the question how human we are so for example in our gut we require certain microbes to give us a healthy uh, functioning of gut and when that uh, microbial balance gets upset we have diseases such as diarrhea and irritable bowel syndrome 
So microbes are very important in terms of both competition and cooperation. Um, and by the way, this diagram should remind you of what we just studied in the lake, how um, different kinds of functions, ex functional gradient can be found in an um, environment. Okay. So now let us look at surface and biofilms. Until now, we have not talked about how microbes interact with the environment. We know they are there, are they just sitting there, are they attached to where they are sitting or are they floating in water yeah? or flying in the air. So let us start with understanding how microbes interact with surface. We know that many microbes love to attach to a surface and there are many advantages why they would love to attach to a surface. For example, let us say we have a stream with relatively low amount of organic material low amount of electron donors and electron accept well it has good electron acceptor oxygen so it's a very healthy stream and it is flowing down now as it flows down it interacts with rocks and other surfaces where microbes can attach so the microbes in water itself don't have a lot of food to eat but once a microbe attaches to the rock it now has a perspective from which it can stay stationary and capture all the nutrients from the flowing water. So attachment has an additional advantage that microbe can capture nutrients in flowing water instead of just flowing with um, in, an in an oligotrophic environment which means in a nutrient deficient environment. So it is advantageous for microbes to attach. There is another reason why microbes would love to attach to a surface. When they attach to a surface and they replicate, they produce uh, daughter cells and the daughter cells also attached to replicate over time what we might have is accumulation of material. So initially we have um, um, just a plain surface with one microbe attached, the microbe replicates produces two daughter cells and so on and so forth replication continues. Over time we have a heap of microbes and now we are talking about a singular population but then we can also have communities, complex communities of microbes. Now, if microbes are faced with some problem like a disinfectant, then only the ones, only the microbes on the boundary would be affected and the microbes closer in this accumulation, this heap of microbes will not be affected. Thus, surface attachment and growing these films on a surface actually um, ensures longevity of microbes. The other advantage of attaching to a, uh, attaching to a surface and growing these films, they are referred to as biofilms by the way, so we have here the second term biofilm, is that these biofilms, uh, microbes in biofilms, they secrete what is called as EPS. So these are uh, extracellular polymeric substances that create a mesh in which the cells can trap not only themselves but can also trap nutrient. So if there is any glucose molecule floating in the water, it will be trapped in this matrix and then the cells can devour it. So thus we see that biofilms can give a protection to uh, microbes and it can create a nutrient rich environment in otherwise nutrient deficient environment. So biofilms are very very beneficial for microbes. Now. Um, if you remember uh, in one of the first few lectures I talked about plating of microbes and culturing. So uh, in plating what we have is we spread the inoculum over a plate and we spread it in such diluted amount that we expect that when they grow from a singular microbe, from a singular bacterium for example, one colony will sprout up which we can see the next day or the day after or after some days. So what the important take home message is that the colony emerged, emerged from singular microbe, singular micro bacteria or some other microbe and it is visible to eye. So we can actually count them, right? However, sometimes in oligotrophic environments such as very clean streams, in drinking water systems, the microbes do not grow into colonies in sense that even though they are sourced from a single microbe, they gr make micro colonies. So the only thing is we can't see them. So for example, let us look at this picture on the right panel, right bottom panel. So this is a hand of a person and we are noticing this under dark light. So this, uh, this is a special technique where we can ask microbes to, we can make microscopes, microbes to, fluoresce, uh, to fl give fluorescent signal under particular, when, when lit by particular light. So whatever you are seeing here uh, giving a fluorescent signal shining is actually microbial microcolonies. So on a hand like mine which I believe is pretty clean right now, 
I can't see microcolonies because they're too tiny. And only when I put my hand under dark light, then I can see, oh, there are these tiny colonies growing that are otherwise invisible to naked eye. So, structurally they are too small to be seen, but the signal can be seen by the eye. Now, uh, microbes not only make micro colonies in our body, on our, on our body and in our body, but also in other, um, in other surfaces. For example, in the top right uh, panel, we have a, a plate titled plants and fungi. So, in the purple you have root, the root of a plant, and in the green you have fungal sheath. So, the fungus it has attached to the root, has entwined with it and is enjoying the nutrient rich environment of the roots and hopefully the root is also benefiting from the fungal attachment to it. So, remember it is not just bacteria, but fungus also attaches, other microbes also attach to surfaces. Here we have another example where we have these microbes who have attached to this surface and this is actually a picture from a microbial mat. So, micro colonies are very small, we can't see them, colonies we can see them, both are um, their source is a singular microbe. Now, microbial mats are very interesting, they are uh, microbes have populated so much, they have grown so much the biofilms that they are centimeters thick and even meter thick maybe and we can see them. Well, I do not know if meter thick exists, but definitely many centimeter thick, we can see them, we can see the gradation. So, let us take a look at that. Uh, already before we take a look at that, let us go back to our root microbe interaction and here we have a plant, a tree and it is making um, food from sunlight, carbon dioxide, water and in its root, it is using roots to get water and other resources that it requires. And you will notice that the roots provide a fixed supply of carbon, the yellow line or nutrients to these microbes here. And these microbes in other, on the other hand, fix the nitrogen and they provide nitrogen source to tree. So, this is a very good example of symbiosis. Alrighty, so now let us take a look at micro, microbial growth on surfaces. So, the first one we have here, we want to understand how biofilms grow and how microbes proliferate in them. Later on when we will be talking about drinking water system and drinking water treatment, it is very important to understand how biofilms will grow in our drinking water system and this is a big challenge by the way. So, let us get our fundamentals right here. So, in this picture we have six different stages of biofilm formation. The first stage is substratum preconditioning. So, initially this is our biotic or abiotic surface. So, a uh, biotic surface would be like root or like a teeth or like my hand or hand. Abiotic would be like a pipe material or a wall, right? Now, or like a catheter when we are talking about medical devices. So, we have these sessile bacteria, they will go, they will attach to the surface and they will prepare the surface for better attachment by my, uh, live microbes. So, the sessile bacteria have attached and they have conditioned the substratum. The substratum is now ready to be sticky to allow things to stick to it and now we have these bat microbes in uh, yellow and purple color, they are planktonic bacteria, what means they are free, freely floating bacteria. So, here we are imagining this blue environment to be um, water. So, they are freely flowing bacteria and they are coming in all the surface ready for attachment and then they get attached. When they get attached, not only do they get attached to the self surface, but they also get attached to each other. So, what we notice in the third step is cell to cell adhesion. So, these microbes they start talking to each other using chemicals. So, they do bio signaling, cell to cell signaling and they tell I am here, who else is here, how many of us are here, are, are you? Uh, are the others, other microbes present here, are they enemies, are they friends, are we going to compete, are we going to cooperate, are we going to have predation. So, they communicate with each other and then they stick to each other according to whatever serves them the best. So, they will stick to the ones when sticking is beneficial. So, they have um, cell to cell adhesion, cell to surface adhesion and they have a very nice communication network. Now, at this stage they also start producing the exopolymer. So, this is EPS which they produce. So, this is a net that they cast. So, if you see here dark blue, darker shade of blue here this background environment is the EPS that they have made. So, initially there was no EPS, just the surface was ready to exit microbe, but now we have EPS layer that will trap both nutrients and trap the microbes. Now, in the next stage we have proliferation. So, in proliferation this biofilm that has grown and this uh, EPS structure that has grown here, see it has some microbes and lot of EPS structure, they will start trapping food. 
so nutrient so diffusion of oxygen and nutrient through biofilm because this is a pipe um, got schematic showing how biofilms grow in pipes so we are talking about oxygen but it not it does, does not have to be necessarily oxygen as we will see later but the nutrients electron acceptor electron donor and everything else that's required will start diffusing into these biofilms and um, the microbes will start proliferating which means they'll start growing in population and then when they start growing in population they produce more and more EPS and they make more complicated structures and this is maturation. So they are now secreting polysaccharide matrix EPS and now they are having more complex structures and very diverse microbial community by normally by this time. Now note here they allow diffusion of oxygen and nutrients. Let us say we have a disinfectant in the environment. Now this disinfectant will also diffuse but will only affect microbes who are at the boundary and some microbes here will survive and once the microbial community in the biofilm becomes more and the biofilm becomes more mature then the population surviving microbes in face of disinfectant would be much higher than microbes that don't survive after a while when the biofilm grows too much that it is structurally unstable and the microbes are too populated they are ready to find new avenues for attaching and for growing then they will have dispersion. So this is where the biofilm releases itself breaks out open and the microbes are released back and they become planktonic bacteria. Now this is where the problem is let us say there was a pathogen hiding and proliferating here. Some pathogens can proliferate in uh, biofilms many cannot but some can or let us say just someone was surviving here saving itself from the disinfectant and getting the minimum nutrients it requires to survive in such an oligotrophic environment. Now in this stage when they are released back into the water then this water can be drunk by a human being or by some other uh, being. So when we open the tap and we get this planktonic bacteria some of them could be pathogenic and next thing we know we are falling sick. Or the other fate of planktonic bacteria is that nobody drinks them but they find more attachment surface and they attach. So you can see this is a cycle and they induce each other. So more biofilms produce more biofilms, one begets the other and next thing we know that our drinking water system is afflicted and with lot of biofilms. So biofilms are rampant in our water distribution system. Now this is a picture you might think how will microbes attach to something like a metal surface. This is a picture showing microbial attachment to um, stainless steel surface. So we have stainless steel surface in the background and all these fluorescence that you see here is from uh, microbes. Alright and this is a picture of different pipe materials. So in the right we have PVC here we have different kinds of uh, metallic pipes and we notice how biofilms develop and how they aid in corrosion. We won't get into depth here but later on when we talk about drinking water treatment I'll talk more about this. The other example of biofilms would be our teeth. So remember this is not just all plaque that forms in our teeth but now we have biofilms shining in our teeth. Now let us talk about microbial mats. So as I said microbial mats can be multiple centimeters. So here we have um, nearly uh, nearly 2 centimeter long deep microbial mat. So we have different layers now, and a beauty of microbial mat is that they have different layers. So here we have 4 millimeter depth of microbial mat. Let us look on the top we have diatoms. Okay. Uh, then we have they are kind of special kind of algae who are very highly sophisticated and I might say microscopically very beautiful cell, cell wall kind of structure and then we have cyanobacteria then we have purple sulfur bacteria and we have sulfate reducing bacteria. So you can see not only do we have layer of microbes but we also have layer of functions and if you remember what is a guild? A guild is microbes of similar functional nature. So this, these are guilds, these are layer of guilds sulfate reducing bacteria you know they can be um, different they can belong to different phylum so they can be very different but they are all same function so this is a guild. Now let us look at some very exciting uh, microbial mat usually found in the coastal regions of Chile and Peru in South America and this is a sulfur oxidizing chemo chemolithotroph thioplaca. Now thioplaca oxidizes sulfur and it is a chemolithotroph and it forms filamentous microbial mat that can go up to 5 to 10 centimeter below the sediment. So we are not just talking about 2 centimeter here as we were talking here but here we are talking 5 to 10 centimeter below the sediment and then they have these hair like filaments that they have outside. These are sheaths that actually 
uh, allow that whole thioplaca together. So this is a microscopic picture and, other, and these are other beautiful pictures from Chile and Peru. Now let us look at terrestrial environment as promised. Now this is a well mature soil, so not just, uh, okay, why would microbes form a gradient? Why will they go from diatom to all the way to sulfate reducing bacteria as we saw in this microbial mat? Because the environment is changing, this is oxygen rich and then oxygen gets depleted. As oxygen gets more and more depleted and let us say for some reason the re is stopped, then the sulfate reducing bacteria will uh, occupy more volume than the other and when sulphate is gone then we will have fermentation or another uh, ox electron acceptor being reduced. Okay, So, and it is not just microbes that form gradient but in nature too we notice that the environment is uh, has a gradient. So this is a fully mature soil and at the bottom we have our zone, our horizon which is a hard bedrock. Then we have sea horizon which is a subsurface layer of soil forming parent material. This could be weathered parent material for the soil. This could be weathered rock, unconsolidated floodplain sediment or just loose sand. Then we have the B horizon here which is a subsurface horizon which is showing depletion of organic matter. So we have rich organic matter dark, so rich organic matter gives soil dark color but here the color has been lost so we have a lot of clay and we have um, depleted organic matter. In A we have dark coloration because organic matter has accumulated. In the O we have leaf litter, so we have a um, lot of biomass waiting to degrade and waiting to uh, make the soil darker in color and make it rich. As I talked earlier about micro environments, terrestrial environments are very complex for many reasons because think of it this way, each pore in the soil and even in a small handful or spoonful of soil, you will have so many pores. Each pore is a micro environment and within this micro environment we have gradient of nutrients, we have gradient of electron acceptors and even we have some pockets within micro environment that will have water, some will not have water as illustrated by this schematic. Thus we can expect very diverse microbial communities in each pore and you know two pores adjacent to each other might have very different microbial communities flourishing. One might be anaerobic, the other might be water loving aerobic. So let us look at this little micropore. We have sand particles, we have some silt, we have some clay, small clay particles, here is air trapped. So oxygen in this air would be utilized until there is no oxygen left and then because there might be nitrogen and other things, we might have nitrogen fixing bacteria or other kind of microbes. Now in each of these uh, zones, we have micro niches that are perfect for a particular kind of microbe to grow. So microbes that love binding to sand will probably stick to sand and grow there. The ones that love to grow between silt and sand or stick on silt will grow sticking on silt. The ones that love to grow in water will grow wherever they find little trace amount of water within the micropore and we are talking really small environment here. Yeah? So we notice that there are a lot of um, nutrient um, diversity and even you know as air gets ex uh, consumed here, initially we will have aerobic microbes here then when air gets oxygen gets consumed, it will move on to um, non-oxygen e electron acceptor zones such as ni microbes that use nitrate, microbes that reduce sulphate or sulphur and eventually to methanogen and fer fermentation fermentation and methanogenesis. So we will see both electron acceptor gradient, we will see nutrient gradient and water gradient, some love water, some like to like water but they like to keep the distance so they will grow in this region instead of growing in this region. Now um, for example I, here I showed you microbes that love to stick to sand. Now there are microbes that um, what they do is and this is a um, electron um, scanning, uh, this is scanning electron microscopy image that is showing you cyanobacteria by the way and these are filaments and what they are doing is um, in this they the filaments and the sand traps the microbes. So the sand is what is trapping the microbe, yeah? like how this picture shows you. The sand is what is asking microbes come and stick to me. So this is what this picture is showing. But here we have a very different phenomena happening. We have loose sand particles in desert and in this particular example we have cyanobacteria again like here and here we have algae and they are binding the soil. So both the microbes can be trapped by the soil, can be trapped by the sand and then they will proliferate there, grow there or undergo succession or they can actually change their environment by binding the soil here. 
all these sand particles are very uh, they're not attached to each other they can disperse very easily but the algae has grown in and around them and bound them together so next thing we know the soil is very compact it's not loose you won't have sand blowing on your face and similarly here's a desert in usa where they conducted investigations intensive comprehensive investigation and they found that it was cyanobacteria that was actually binding the sand particles together and thus changing the characteristics of soil and changing the characteristic of vegetation now within soil as you now notice that there are different micro environments there are different functional gills and thus we notice a very very diverse microbial communities in our soil and this is just a snapshot of some uh, very uh, basic eukaryotes archaea and bacteria that have been known to found in soil each of these kingdoms whether we go to eukaryotes or bacteria or archaea each of them are very very diverse so we can't say that oh soil you will have gram positive bacteria spirochetes plantomyces or proteobacteria <laughs> you'll have a lot of microbes and within each of them for example proteobacteria is a very very broad phylum within proteobacteria we have alpha beta gamma delta and epsilon proteobacteria and within each of them we have very different um, kinds of microbes for example some delta by delta proteobacteria are sulfate uh, reducers some are sulfur oxidizers some are aerobic and they don't care about sulfate reduction or sulfur oxidation. So, as you notice, microbial communities in soil interest terra are very, very diverse. So, my dear students, this is all for today. In next class, we will move on to aquatic environments and we will see the ecology of aquatic environments. Thank you.